Okay, good afternoon and welcome back everyone to our um, Thursday afternoon options education session. My name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play. And here today we're talking about what I believe is one of the most um, important topics for all investors, whether you are a stock investor, options trader, Forex futures, regardless of what asset class you choose to trade your portfolio in, Trading psychology is, in my opinion, the most important thing for all investors to pay attention to because, you know, I've been working as a market strategist for 15 years. And the one thing that I see a lot of investors spend a lot of time on is their strategy. For those of you that are technical investors, learning different indicators, learning different trading strategies. For those of you that are fundamental investors, looking at balance sheets, looking at different ways to value a company. However, those forms of analysis, um, you know, you, even though you spend all that time doing so, that's not what makes you money. What makes you money is the trades that you actually make. And many investors that I've worked with over the past 15 years struggle to reach profitability over the long run. Um, and this really comes down to, you know, when I look at investors that are successful versus everyone else that find themselves frustrated or find themselves inconsistent with their trading, it usually boils down to their risk management and how they go about thinking uh, about their portfolio and risk management. It rarely has to do with your strategy or the types of indicators that you're using or who you're following. I, I tend to find that many investors who struggle with trading uh, Instead of instead of taking the time to learn about risk management, uh, they they the second a trading strategy doesn't work, they start looking for new indicators. They start looking for someone new to follow. They start looking for a new trading system, um, and that cycle continuously continues to repeat itself over and over again, no matter what system they follow or what indicators they use. So today, what I want to do is I want to break down why I think trading psychology is so important at the core of successful traders and why your indicators, while important, are not the keys to success. So before we get started here, what we're going to discuss here today is purely for education and demonstration purposes. It is not a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell any specific securities. So uh, just a bit of housekeeping today. We're here to talk about trading psychology. Tomorrow morning, we have a members only market outlook session. This is our like in our normal Tuesday market outlook session, especially as we start to see some weakness here in equity markets over the past couple of days. Uh, I think it'll be an interesting session to go over where we currently stand and what our outlook is going forward. Um, Next Thursday, we're going to do a quick review of everything we've learned during the month of February and also a market outlook session, giving people also a sense, a time to provide some symbols that we'll all look at here together. And then next Friday, we're going to end the month here on our thematic investment theory series. We've already uh, covered things like electric vehicles, renewable energy, cybersecurity. So next Friday, we're going to be covering the future of water and talking about water scarcity um, and, the, and the technology and the company companies that power uh, our future of water. So those are the things that are coming up. But for today, we're going to first talk a little bit about trading psychology. We'll talk a little bit about the, um, the types of of, of blowups that I tend to see in many investors' accounts and talk a little bit about why that, that happens. Then we're going to talk about the golden rule of risk management so that you can understand right from the beginning. You know, we're not going to wait, um, have you wait to the end to figure this out. We're going to tell you what the golden rule right up front is. And then what we're going to do is we're going to break it down by looking at linear versus exponential functions and get a sense for how they actually will, 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 um, will perform and why the math behind uh, certain rule management techniques work for your portfolio. Then we would really want to talk about, you know, blowing up your account, meaning what does it actually take to blow up your account and what can you do to prevent blowing up your account by using math? And then talking a little bit about consecutive losses, because we've all had consecutive losses in our accounts. They, they certainly hurt. So we want to understand just how many consecutive losses should you plan for in your trading? And how can you, uh, you know, make sure that when you do have a series of consecutive losses that they don't blow up your account? And then at the very end, we'll open this up for Q&A. But the primary question that I want to help investors walk away from here today is an understanding as to what sets professional traders really 
apart from everyone else when it comes to their trading. Um, and again, from my perspective, working in, in this field for about 15 years, working with retail institutional traders, the one thing that sets professional traders aside from everyone else, it's not their strategy. It's not what indicators they use. So if you're thinking that you, ju you just haven't quite found the right strategy yet, or if you just quite haven't quite found the right set of indicators yet, I promise you that's not what's keeping you from succeeding. What's keeping you perhaps from succeeding or when you find yourself frustrated from trading really comes down to risk management. So my name is Tony Zhang. I'm the chief strategist here at Options Play. And I want to leverage my 15 years of as being a market strategist, working with clients to help you understand how you can overcome the risk management techniques that professional traders have and overcome some of the failures and maybe frustrations that you may have in your portfolios to switch the, the way that you think about your portfolio, the way you think about risk, um, and hopefully point you in the right direction towards successful trading. So what I have here is a chart of what I see quite a bit from retail traders in terms of their account. So I have two charts here overlaid one over the other. You have the blue bar chart, which is the series of wins and losses you might have in a portfolio, and the green line referring to the account equity or the total balance of the trading account. And this is something that I tend to see very often where accounts have small wins, small losses, small series of wins, small losses. Um, and you kind of, and you're, you're learning, maybe you're slowly growing your account or maybe it's flat for a little bit, but grows a little bit over time. And then once in a while, you tend to see uh, these really large losses in your portfolio um, that account for, you know, substantial, even though you're growing your account slowly over time, that one trade knocks you down so far back that even as you continue to progress, you're still below your starting point here. So if anyone, if anyone here can relate to that, please type one into the chat window. If you can relate to the fact that you have this series of wins, series of losses, and you are, um, uh, small wins, small losses, and then followed by one or two really big losses that are just outsized uh, losses versus the, the losses that you normally take. And I see so many ones coming across the screen, right? And, you know, when I see this type of loss, you know, many times what after these types of losses, this is when I see a lot of investors, you know, they'll cancel their, 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 you know, whoever they're subscribed to, they'll, whatever charting package they're using, they'll, they'll kind of get rid of it or they'll find some new indicators and they go out there and they say, you know, what's wrong with my strategy? You know, my strategy sucks. I got to go find a new uh, person to follow or a new trading system or new indicator. And when I see this type of behavior or when I see this type of result in a portfolio, the first thing I notice is that this has nothing to do with your strategy, because if it really was the strategy that was that was in, you know that was not very um, efficient, if it was who you're following is just perhaps terrible at trading, then you wouldn't see big losses like this. What you would see is a fairly consistent uh, losing streak where it was just constantly small winners over and over again. But that's not what we see. What we see are these big blowups, and what that leads me to believe is that th this has nothing to do with your strategy. This all has to do with our mindset and how we go about thinking uh, um, uh, about hanging on to losses because we've all been there where we make a trade. So here's a trade. Here's a stock that was trading around a $26 support level. That was previous resistance. It is now support. And when it reaches that support level again, you say to yourself, okay, that's a pretty solid support level. Let me buy this stock. And you buy the stock and the stock goes up a little, but very quickly it starts to reverse lower. Now, many times investors will say to themselves, well, yes, I was perhaps wrong on that initial trade. I'm losing a little bit. But you know, if I buy a little bit more and the stock rallies a little bit, I'll get myself back to break even. Once that happens, I'll get out of the trade. I just don't want to take a loss because I don't, I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to take a loss. I, I want to get myself back to break even. So we enter this behavior of not wanting to be wrong, taking on additional risks to try to get ourselves back to break even, 
only potentially, and sometimes this works, right? And, and many times, maybe half the time you do this, it works. Uh, but, but the other half of the time, it doesn't. And what happens is the stock keeps moving lower. And now, you know, the first trade didn't work. You, so you risk some money to get into that trade. The second trade that you got into, you risk some more and it didn't work. And now by the time this happens to, the th to you the third time, you start getting a little desperate. And at this point, you know, you bought the stock at 26. It's now down to 18, 19 bucks, 17 bucks. And many times I'll see investors, they'll start making up reasons as to why it's now a good time to buy that stock. They'll start looking at things like technical indicators. They'll say, if I like the stock at 26, I must really like it at 17. And they see that, oh, this, the, the, the technical indicators are over, oversold. So it must be a great time to buy this stock only to this, for the stock to continue moving lower. And we start to throw these hail marries. And by the time you get to the third, fourth trade, you really have lost substantially more money in, in, the, tr in the trade itself. Does that have anything to do with your strategy? Did, did the support level up here strategy, was that the failure here? No, that was not it at all. It was our attachment to being right, right? And, and here's the thing, you know, this is, this is perfectly normal for a human being to, to want to be right. Um, as humans, we, we're attached to winning and we're attached to being right. It's part of our DNA. It's part of our culture. So there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with you for thinking this way. But what we want to do is we want to show you why you need to break this cycle because that is what's wrong with many. That this is what causes those blowups. This is you know it's not your strategy. It's not the fact that you know buying stocks that near support levels was a wrong strategy. You need to find a new strategy. But many times when when investors lose big big amounts of money on trades like this, they give up on their strategy and they say my strategy was wrong. That support level trade that I made, I, I can't I can't do that strategy anymore. I got to find something new. And this is our human brain at work, you know, working against us. So what we want to learn is how do we remove ourselves from our attachment to winning or attachment to being right? And this is really in order to understand how we can switch our brains from doing that. Or I'm actually going to uh, you know take it take a look at trading psychology because I would say probably some of the top questions that I get asked on a daily basis are questions like, I lost money on a trade. How do I repair a losing trade? What this tells me is that people are not really interested in learning. They're really just interested in figuring out how do I make sure that I, you know, this trade that I was wrong on doesn't end up being wrong. Um, you know, how do I make my money back on a losing trade? Uh, how, you know, I, or, you know, I get comments all the time from people who will say, you know, you've had three trades, three picks in a row that, that have lost money. You know, your service sucks. Um, you know, what this tells me is this, this person or whoever's asking this type of question is focused on the wrong thing. They're focused on winning. They're Focus on, on on not losing, and and the question comes down to: Are you asking the right question? And in order to help answer that question, I point us to a book called Infinite versus Finite Games, which was written in 1986 by an author named James James P. Cars. And after I did the session here a couple of uh, months ago, I actually had someone reach out to me saying that they they actually had James P. Cars as a professor in NYU back in the 80s, and and they remember reading this book and you know, you would think that this person had taken a business course or some kind of, you know, finance course from James P. Carson. The answer is he was not anywhere near a business or a finance professional. He was actually a religious philosopher, but he had this idea that there are two types of games, infinite and finite games. So to explore that, you know, finite games are types of games that we are all familiar with. This is what we traditionally call a game where you have a defined players, and there are fixed rules to the game. And in a finite game the, game, the game ends at a certain point. That's where the term finite comes from. It ends at a certain point. And at the end of the game, you declare both a winner and a loser. So when you play a finite game, the goal of a finite game is to win, right? Because there's only two possible outcomes. You either win or you lose. And the goal is to win. And an example like a finite game are ones that we're all familiar with, like football, basketball, blackjack, all of these games, you know, your goal is to win at all costs right? And then 
James also said that there's another type of game. It's called an infinite game. These are games where you have known and unknown players. So, you know, there are people that you know that are playing the game. There are also people that are playing the game that you're not even aware of. And in an infinite game, there's no agreed upon rules. There's no set of rules that we have to all abide by. You're in the game. And the, the key here, why if it's called an infinite game is because the game never ends. There's no end to the game. And when you think about this, like what is the goal of an infinite game? The goal of an infinite game is that there are either players in the game or there are dropouts or what we would consider players who no longer have the resources to stay in the game. So a good example of this, in my opinion, is like running a business. Running a business is an example of an infinite game. There are people that are in business that you're aware of. There are also people in business that you're not aware of. And there's no rules to running a business. And your only and there's and your only goal when you run a business is to stay in business. There's no winning in business. There's no losing in business. You're either in business or you're out of business. And you really have to think of trading in the, in the same lines because that's exactly what trading is like. You either have a portfolio with enough capital to continue trading another day, or you've blown up your account and you no longer have the resources to continue trading. We've seen so many examples of this in, for those of you that have been following Wall Street Bets and Reddit and people who have blown up their accounts overnight. You know, some people who have turned $10,000 into $10 million and then vice versa the very following day blew up those $10 million down to zero again. Uh, you know, I cannot tell you enough how many of my friends, personally, my friends that are in my generation of millennials that have you know, turned $10,000 into hundreds of thousand dollars and then lost it all a, a few months later, you know, trading these really far out of the money uh, calls and, and, and types of option strategies. So when you think about an infinite game and you realize that when you're, when you're uh, trading is not, there's no winning or losing, you start to realize that you know, if you can't win in, in, in an infinite game, what should you be focusing on? Because when you're playing a finite game, it's clear as to what you should be focusing on. But when you're playing an infinite game, which is what trading is, what should be your focus? Your focus should be making sure that you do not drop out of the game. So how do you make sure you don't drop out of trading? How do you make sure you don't drop out as, as a trader? And the answer to it is making sure that you don't blow up your account. As long as you don't blow up your account, you have the ability to continue trading. So your goal as a trader is to make sure that you don't blow up your account at all costs. Make sure that you do everything you can to prevent those big losses. So it's as simple as that. Now, what we're going to do now is tell you how you can achieve that, right? How can you make sure that you are you don't blow up your account? Um, you know, what does staying in the game even mean when we're talking about it from a trading perspective? So, the golden rule of risk management to help you achieve not blowing up your account is actually surprisingly simple. It is probably one of the simplest rules that you can possibly apply to trading, and that is never risk more than 1% to 2% of your total portfolio value per trade. Now, so for those of you that trade options, uh, you know that means that every single option strategy you trade, there is a max risk component to that strategy. So if you're buying a call, the debit that you pay on that call option, that's your max risk. If you're trading a credit spread, there's the margin requirement on your credit spread is your max risk. If you're short a straddle, which you technically have unlimited risk for, you have to do a little bit of math in terms of probability-wise, what's your max risk during the time, the lifetime of your of your short straddle. But regardless of what you're trading, you have to figure out roughly what your max risk or exactly what your max risk of your strategy is and make sure that that amount does not exceed one to 2% of your total account value. So we have a easy table here. Uh, this table, uh, this table, as you can see here, that's your account value. And what you can do is so let's say you have a hundred thousand dollar account. That means every single trade that you make should never exceed $2,000 in max risk. So, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through some of the math behind this, why this 2% rule exists. It doesn't just exist out of nowhere. We didn't just put our finger in the air and said, oh, 2% sounds good. Um, but really part of the psychology around, you know, number one, keep keeping your total risk a small percentage of your portfolio is the fact that smaller losses 
are easier to accept and let go of. So for example, if you have a $100,000 portfolio and you have a trade that loses 2%, that hurts, right? Losing $2,000 is going to hurt, but you still have 98% of your portfolio intact to make your next trade. So you still have plenty of capital left to put into play to get yourself back to break even and continue trading. Um, so smaller losses are, in my opinion, emotionally easier to let go of. If you have a $100,000 portfolio and you've risked $15,000 in a single trade, once that trade starts to go south, you have a really hard time emotionally just to say, okay, I was wrong. Let me cut my losses and move on. You become emotionally attached to that trade or what poker players call pot committed. Um, you feel that you've already risked so much money you cannot afford to lose. That is the worst possible scenario you can put yourself in as a trader. So your goal is to stay in the game at all costs by preventing your account from blowing up. And if you use a small percentage of your account per trade, you're going to have a very hard time actually to blow up your account. Does that make sense, everyone? Please type two into the chat window if this makes sense to you. Perfect. Okay, so... To understand this rule and understand the math behind it, we need to understand the, the difference between a linear versus exponential function. Now, I know a lot of you here on this on this webinar, uh, many of you are engineers. You know, I've spoken to a lot of you. So th for those of you that are engineers, this is very straightforward to you. But for those of you that are not as math oriented, you know, I used to find that trying to teach the difference between linear versus exponential functions was a little difficult. But I will say since the start of COVID, people have had a much better understanding about exponential functions because exponential functions really creep up on you. Um, at first, you know, linear functions really easy to understand. It's just a line, right? But exponential functions at first, um, each step is so small, you don't even notice it. It's kind of like the first few um, days and weeks of the coronavirus where we had two cases, three cases, five cases, and it just went on for days and days and days where it's just single digits and then kind of went into the teens. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, we just had tens of thousands of cases every single day and it was growing at a rate that was just completely out of control. So I think people have a better understanding of an exponential functions. But the one thing you want to remember is that the compounds of, of the returns and losses in your portfolio, they don't grow at a linear function, they grow at an exponential function. So for example, uh, one way to visualize this and one way to think about your portfolio is how much do you need to get in terms of return to get yourself back to break even after a, a, a loss in your portfolio? So what I have here on my chart is the blue bar is the loss that you have in your portfolio. And the green bar is how much you need to get yourself back to break even. So if you lose 10% of your portfolio, so you have a 10,000, uh, let's say you have a $100,000 portfolio, let's say you lose 10% of it. So you're down to $90,000. How much does the $90,000 now need to return to get yourself back to 100,000? The answer is 11%. So you lose 10%, you got to make 11% back to get yourself back to break even. That's that's deep, that's that's um, in my opinion uh, doable, right? You lose twenty percent. Um, you have to you have to now return twenty five percent to get yourself back to break even. That's a little harder, right? So you lose twenty percent. You need twenty. Whoops. You lose 20%, you need 25% to get yourself back to break even. That's a little harder. But if you lose 30%. Now it starts to get some increasingly difficult, right? You lose 30%, but you need 43% just to get yourself back to break even. Now this starts to look increasingly difficult. At 40%, this starts to get to the point where I would say it's almost impossible for you to get back to break even once you lost 40% of your portfolio. At 50%, you need 100%, 60%, 150%. If you lose 90% of your portfolio, you need 900% return to get yourself back to break even. So, you know, think about 900% return. How many years do you think it might take you to, to make 900% return? So you can easily wipe out one year uh, in one year, you can easily wipe out multiple years of returns going forward. And that is why it's so important, you know, in this first chart that you prevent these types of blow ups because the amount of time it takes for you to get back is so long that even small, even small blow ups become increasingly difficult to get yourself back to break even. Does that make sense, everyone? Please type three into the chat window if this makes sense to you. So what we tend to find 
with this type of data is that when you start to exceed anything greater than 25% loss of your total portfolio value. So if you have a hundred thousand dollar portfolio, if you ever lose more than $25,000 in your total portfolio, it becomes very difficult to get yourself ever back to break even without, um, uh, without uh, depositing more money which means that your only goal at all cost is to make sure that you stay, you keep your losses in your portfolio in this zone. Because in this zone, you can generally figure, you can find a way back to break even without having to um, spend that much more time to get yourself back to break even. Losing 10%, getting back 10%, uh, 11%, that's manageable. Losing 20%, getting 25% back, that's somewhat manageable. Anything greater than that, it becomes increasingly difficult to get yourself back to break even. So th that's the first reason why you want to keep your losses small. I'm sorry, your per risk per trade small. Because here's the thing, and, and some people will say, well, okay, I'll start risking 25% of my account count per trade going forward. I will not risk more than that. That doesn't work because you all you need is two losing trades in a row and all of a sudden you're here. And unless you somehow think that you're never going to have two losing trades in a row, that is a that is a recipe for disaster. The second thing you want to start paying attention to is how many trades does it actually take to blow up your account for every percentage of your trade that you're that you're risking. So for example, if you're risking 10% of your account per trade, which is well in excess of what we would recommend, it would take you 10 trades to blow up your entire account, right? If you risk exactly 10% of your account per trade, every single time you place a trade, you're risking 10%, uh, 10 trades and you've blown up your account. 9%, uh, you're able to do 11. 8%, you're able to do about 12, 12 13. 7%, you able to do about 14 trades. And then as you can see, it grows at a very slow but exponential pace. So for every one percentage of your account, you risk less, at first, it's not really noticeable in terms of the number of extra trades that you can make. But as you start getting down here to about 2%, you need 50 trades in a row to blow up your account. So for one percentage move generates an exponential growth in terms of the number of trades it takes for you to blow up your account. If you only risk 1% of your account per trade, you can have 100 consecutive losses in your portfolio before you blow up your account. If you have even 50 consecutive losses in a row, you should probably just trade the exact opposite of whatever it is that you want to trade. If you think you want to go long all these stocks, you should probably short that stock or vice versa. But I would say that's very, very difficult to have 50 uh, consecutive losing trades in a row. But, it, but if you do find yourself in that position, flip your strategy. So um, the, this is again why you want to be in this particular zone because it takes so many trades to blow up your account. And you, again, our goal here is not to win. Our goal is not to be right. Our goal is to prevent our accounts from being blown up. So by doing so, by risking one to 2%, it, it really increases our ability to make sure that we don't blow up our accounts. So let's now talk a little bit about consecutive losses, right? Because at the end of the day, even if you risk 2% of your account per trade, but if you have 20 losing trades in a row, you're going to lose 40% of your account, right? So we need to understand, you know, what is a reasonable um, amount of trades that we may have a consecutive loss on? Because if any of you that have ever traded long enough, you've known, you know that there will be some time in your trading career where you're going to have four, five, six, maybe even seven, sometimes 10 losing trades in a row, just a string of bad luck. And for those of you that want to, you know, learn a little bit more about this, you know, we know that flip of a coin, you have a 50-50 shot of getting heads or tails, you know, if you do if you do those flips long enough over a long period of time, there will always be segments and series where you just have a consecutive string of heads or string of tails. And we have to account for just a bad luck or a bad string of trades. And, and the question is, how many should you plan for? And what you should generally need to look at is the type of strategy that you're trading. 
So on one extreme, if you're buying call options all the time, that's the only thing you're buying, you're buying call options, you're going to have a lower win rate versus if let's say you're outright selling naked calls or puts, you're going to naturally have a higher win rate. Um, however, I think most investors will find that their win rates will be somewhere in the 40 to 60% range when you're trading options. So when you have 40 to 60% um, win rates, you can see roughly what is your percentage of having a certain number of consent executive losers. So if let's say we just say on average, we have a 50% win rate, um, you know, three to uh, one to five, one to three percent chance of five to six consecutive lo lo losers in a row. In my opinion, that should be the minimum uh, number of consecutive losses you should generally plan for in your trading career, uh, in your uh, year of trading, so that you know at some point during the year, you may have a string of bad trades where five or six consecutive losses are, are, uh, are registered in your account. And what you want to make sure is that if you have the string of bad luck of five to six consecutive losses, which again, if any of you have traded long enough, you've probably seen at least five to six consecutive losing trades in a row, making sure that even when that happens, you do not risk more than 25% of your account. Because again, in that, in that, um, in this chart here before, if you exceed 25% losses, it is difficult for you to get back from. So what we're trying to do is prevent ourselves from risking 25% of our account. So if we risk 2% of our account per trade and we have five consecutive losses in a row, what that means is that I have roughly about a 3% chance of losing 10% of my portfolio. So in a year, I have about a 3% chance that, that I will lose 10% of my portfolio uh, in that year. Um, this gives me some confidence because that's well below the 25% of my portfolio that I want to make sure that no matter what happens, I don't lose that 25%. So a 10% loss in my portfolio, I need 11% return to get myself back to break even. This is, in my opinion, an acceptable range of risk. And that's why the 2% rule works here, right? Even if you have seven consecutive losses in a row, you're still looking at 14% portfolio, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, you have a 0.78% chance of a 14% loss in your portfolio. Uh, you have about a 0.1% chance of a 20% loss in your portfolio. So as you can see, you know, I, I'll, I'll accept the fact that I have one tenth of a percent of losing 20% of my portfolio. That's something I can work with. That's something I can live with in my trading account, okay? So that's why the 2% rule works here for your trading. Now, here's the thing. I have to say this with a huge caveat because I've seen investors stick to the 2% rule, but the one caveat here is that you have to think about your, your positions as a concentrated group because I also at the same time see practitioners that will risk no more than 2% of their account per trade, but then load up on a bunch of positions that all expire on the same day that are all long, perhaps all in the same sector. So for example, if you have a bunch of technology um exposure that are all expiring this Friday. And let's say you have a bunch of long calls on technology stocks that all expired this Friday. Guess what? If the markets continue to do its decline here over the tomorrow, um, you're likely going to see, a, a, you know, all your positions perhaps see losses across the board. So you need to think about not just how much are you risking per trade, but do you have concentrated position where the aggregate of the, of the positions um, are, are, are going to potentially push you above the edge. So even though you're risking 2% of your account per trade, if let's say you have two trades in, in a single expiration, then what you have to do is you have to group those together. So it's, not, it's really not having 2% of your account per trade. You're really risking 4% of your account per trade if you're used to having two trades that all expire on the same day that are perhaps all long or and perhaps all in the same sector. So if let's say you have 2% of your account per trade, but you load up on double the positions and you have five consecutive losses, now, instead of having a 3% chance of a 10% loss, you now have a 3% chance of a 20% loss because you've doubled up on the number of positions that, that all expire on the same day. Does that make sense? Please type four into the chat window if that makes sense to you. 
right? So this is really important for options traders because I see too many options investors that just take the 2% rule, but load up on a bunch of positions that all expire on the same day. Guess what? If you do that, it's not really sticking to the 2% rule. You're really, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's okay to have multiple trades that expire on the same day. I'm not saying you can't do that, but just be aware of the additional exposure that you're taking when you do have that. And just to take this example to a bit of an extreme, let's say you have five trades that all expire on the same day that are all risking 2%. Now, 2% two, two per trade, but you have five trades per expiration. If you have five consecutive losses, now you have a 3% chance of a 50% portfolio loss because you've significantly increased your exposure that all expire on the same day. So be very careful when you're thinking about your portfolio. You're not just thinking about each individual trade. You're also thinking about what is the aggregate risk that I'm taking on each expiration cycle. And then lastly, the one last thing that you can also, that you need to account for that does work in your favor is, you know, potentially take, using stop losses, right? Many of our positions, we use stop loss techniques. So especially on debit spreads, long calls, long puts, these types of trades, you usually have a stop loss where before you lose 100% of the premium that you pay, you get yourself out of the position. So this, this is where stop losses can be effective in helping you reduce your risk. So let's say you're risking 2% of your account per trade and you have five consecutive losses before we were showing you that you have a 3% chance of a 10% portfolio loss. But if you apply a 50% stop loss to that, that same 2% rule with the five consecutive losses, now you have a 3% 3, 3 chance of a 5% portfolio loss because you've effectively cut your losses in half. Now, remember, Stop losses, usually, uh, you know, there's some slippage on stop losses. So you may not get filled at exactly 50%. The market could open the next day and you get filled at 60% loss. So give yourself a little wiggle room here when you're calculating stop losses. Um, you know, usually I like to say, even if I, even if I have a 50% stop, you know, I might account for a 55% actual loss once I account for slippage and um, when the trade actually gets executed. So those are some of the things that you want to consider here uh, when you're thinking about your total portfolio loss. So just to reiterate everything that we talked about here, you want to make sure that the dollar amount that you're willing to risk per trade is based on your total account value. So if you make big deposits, if you make big withdrawals from your portfolio, you want to make sure that you recalculate the one, the one to 2% rule. If you take a, if you have a big gain and you have a large gain in your portfolio, or if you take a big loss, you need to account for that, right? So, so let's just say, you know, before this, uh, you know, you, you follow this rule, but you know, you, you get yourself distracted and, and you take a big loss in your portfolio. You need to recalculate your 2% rule every single time you have a significant change in the value of your portfolio. So if you have a $100,000 portfolio that is now a $50,000 portfolio, you need to adjust your position limits from 2000 down to 1000. Um, and this is something that you can use the options play tool to help you calculate. We have a risk and investment calculator within options play. And what it does is it actually takes into account your max loss. So if you use the options play tool, the, th the third dot here, this is our risk and investment calculator. Um, you can use the tool to say, okay, I want to risk $2,000 because I have a, a $10,000 account and options play will automatically calculate the appropriate number of contracts for you to trade to stay within your risk tolerance here. So if you choose, um, uh, let's, what's a, what's a stock like, let's say you're trading Coca-Cola and let's say you have a big account and you're willing to, uh, and you can risk $5,000 per trade, uh, $5,000. As you can see, you can trade 25 contracts of the call, 29 contracts of the vertical spread. So you can trade a lot of contracts, but it's dependent on how much you have in your portfolio and how much you can risk based on that 2% rule. But again, the 2% rule is designed to help remove some of the emotional side of trading. Again, the emotions is really what drives us to do things like this, right? It's our attachment to being right. It's our attachment to winning and, and not wanting to have a loss that, that creates this. So 
utilize the tools that are available to you here at Options Play. And sometimes, you know, and, and I see this a lot, especially with higher price stocks, you know, sometimes someone will say, okay, my risk, my risk tolerance is $2,000. I can't, I, I should not risk more than $2,000. But someone, you know, maybe puts out a trade that's really attractive to you on Tesla. And you've seen all these other people make a lot of money on Tesla. And you feel a little left out. And you say, you know, my friend told me about this trade that he made $10,000 on it last time. I want to get into this trade. It exceeds my risk more than I want. But, you know, I, I feel good about it. I, I like this guy who I follow or whoever it is. Don't be tempted. You know, this is really where discipline is what's going to help you stay consistent as a trader. You know, I, at the end of the day, it is a combination of risk management and discipline. Um, you know, if you look, look at successful poker players, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the strategy behind it? It's really discipline and calculating probabilities and odds and making sure that they only place bets that make sense for them. So make sure that when you place a trade, Make sure that you're staying within your risk limits. Make sure that it stays, it, it, it's, it's suitable for you from a risk perspective first before anything else. I always tell investors, you know, when you're looking at a trade um, and you're using our PL simulator, don't look at the returns first. Look at the risk first. Look at what happens if this trade goes south. What if Tesla pulls back to seven hundred dollars? You know, you think it's going to go to a thousand dollars, but what if you're wrong and it goes down to seven hundred dollars? Ask yourself: If I lost fifty-seven hundred dollars on this trade, am I going to be a? You know, am I comfortable with that? Is that going to be uh, blowing up a significant portion of my portfolio where I'm going to be emotionally attached to this trade, where I'm not going to be able to sleep, and I'm going to make? potentially bad decisions as a result of it? If the answer is yes, you shouldn't even bother looking at how much money you can make because you have no right to be in that trade to begin with. So don't look at potential returns first. Always look at what your risk is. Ask yourself, am I comfortable with that risk? So if I have a $100,000 portfolio and I can lose $5,700 in a single trade, guess what? I'm not going to trade it no matter how tempting it is, no matter how um, impressive the person I'm following that told me to trade this is. Uh, stay in your lane. That's the most important thing that you can remember uh, when it comes to trading. And if you are in your lane, if $5,700 is something that's suitable for you from a risk perspective, then take a look at, oh, I can potentially make $10,000 on this trade. That looks like a great risk to reward. Let me consider making this trade, you know, if Tesla does make it back up to $900 or so. Um, but don't make that judgment call. Don't even look at the potential returns until you first looked at the risk side and, and understand that it's a risk tolerance that you're capable and willing to take. So with that, that covers what I wanted to share with you here today. Uh, like I said, this is so, so important uh, of a topic for anyone here who's a trader. Um, for the, and, and I know many of you have seen this type of uh, presentation here before. And for those of you that have, I hope that this was a good refresher for you. For those of you that are first time viewers of this session, I hope that you take the time to uh, watch the recording and go through the slides and, and and, and do a quick calculation on your portfolio. What's your portfolio size? What's 2% of that? And use that number every single time you plug into the risk and investment calculator and see how many contracts you can trade. If you stick to those rules, I promise you, you will get more consistent as a trader and you will more likely prevent yourself from having these types of account blowups. And if you do have these types of account blowups, Remember, it's not your strategy. It's not the indicators you use. It's not who you're following that's 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 blowing up your account. Because if that was the case, you would just see a series of losers all the time. But when you have winners and losers, winners and losers, followed by these big, huge losses, it has nothing to do with your strategy, has nothing to do with your indicators. It all has to do with your attachment to being right and your attachment to winning and not willing to let go of that and, and just uh, are really focusing on the wrong thing because you're not playing an infinite, you're not playing a finite game, you're playing an infinite game. Once you make that recognition that you're playing an infinite game, you start to focus on the right things and that's the make sure that you don't drop out of the game. It's not, it has nothing to do with about winning. Don't be, don't be consumed with winning. Um, and, and if you can switch that, that, that way of thinking, that is what differentiates professional traders and successful traders from everyone else. So with that, um, what I'll do is I'll open this up for Q and a here. And while I do, 
I just want to say a big thank you to our members to allowing us to continue to do this. For those of you, uh, I hope that you're able to support us to allow us to continue doing this. For those of you that are on a free trial, membership is just $75 a month or $500 a year. You can sign up using the link here on your screen. Now, there is both a Q&A window and a chat window. So for those of you that have a question, please type your question into the Q&A window, um, and I'll try to answer as many questions as I have time for out of the Q&A window here here today. Um, let's see. I, I, a lot of comments. Uh, you know, I really appreciate the comments here. Um, uh, Arnaud is asking, what's the difference between I want to risk versus I want to invest on the options play platform? Great question. His question was on the risk and investment calculator. There are two options. One is how I want to invest and one is I want to risk. So risk is really what you're interested in when you're trading options. If you're investing, meaning if you're buying the stock, that's what you want to use in terms of investing. So in, we built the I want to invest for many uh, you know, equity investors that are used to thinking about what dollar amount of stock they did they, they typically buy. You know, a lot of stock traders, they usually, when they find a stock they like, they'll buy $10,000 with the stock or $50,000 with that stock. So that's what we built this for, because for those investors who are used to thinking in dollar terms of how much stock they're willing to buy, and then it will calculate the appropriate number of contracts to trade the equivalent of that from an options contract perspective. But I think that from a risk management perspective, what's more important is thinking about how much are you willing to risk per trade and making sure that you calculate the appropriate um, contracts off of that. So great question. Uh, Richard's saying, is this part is this part of the reason that you see limit the number of positions that you put on? Yes, this is greatly one of the reasons why you need to limit the number of positions that you put on. Because if you put on a lot of positions and you stick to the 2% rule per position, that is another, uh, I would say, reason that some investors still blow up their accounts while risking 2% per trade because they'll risk 2%, but then they have a long position in NVIDIA, a long position in Qualcomm, a long position in uh, Micron, and all these semiconductor stocks that are all for all intents and purposes the same trade you know so if you have 10 of those positions at 2% per trade it's like risking 20% on a single trade so so be careful right and now you can spread things out right maybe you're long uh, one semiconductor stock and then you're short utilities right those two are fairly uncorrelated so those two can be you know combined together and you don't necessarily have to combine them into the same trade but um, so be, be cognizant of what you're trading, because if you have them all grouped together, all expire in the same day, for all intents and purposes, they're not, um, you know, you're not really sticking to the 2% rule. Um, Arun, using 2% limit for, the, for a given expiration, how many trades uh, for that expiration date? So, you know, I think that you, if you exceed more than two to three trades per expiration date per long short, um, you know, that's when you can start getting yourself into some trouble. Um, but my point is don't load up five trades. You know, I think two to three is reasonable uh, within one expiration cycle. Now, if you want to put on five trades that all expire on the same expire expiry date, you can, you just have to adjust the percentage per trade. You might only risk 1% of your account per trade on those trades, or maybe even half a percent if you want to load up on a lot of positions that all expire on the same day. Uh, if I sell a naked put with the stock trading at $100 and I sell a put for 95 and the stock drops in 94, however, I still have 29 days to expiration. Would you recommend taking a loss even though I have 29 days to expiration? I generally don't, you know, with a short put, first of all, you know, you generally sell a put because you're okay with owning the stock. You know, so if you're down $1 and you still have 29 days to go, I don't think that's, that's an, you don't necessarily need to take lo a loss on that trade. You know, if you're, if you're in the last two weeks and you're losing money, money and you're and this is and you don't feel like it's going to recover then I do think it's time to uh, to cut your losses but with 29 days I think you still have some time to try to have that trade work out um, can you recommend a tr book to learn about odds and probability? Thanks, a great session. Um, Roger, uh, why don't you send me an email at info at optionsplay.com? I want to do a little research before I answer that question. Um, so I sent you a, a link on the chat window, info at optionsplay.com. 
Um, how would you put a stop loss on a vertical? Tariq, I actually just recorded a video on this yesterday. Now, not every platform supports uh, stop losses on a vertical spread. I trade with Thinkorswim uh, or TD Ameritrade. They offer uh, you know, the ability to place a stop order on a on a vertical spread. And I actually just recorded a video. We'll, we'll probably uh, um, release that early next week. Um, so it, it depends on your broker. I would call, I would contact your broker and have them walk you through placing a stop loss. But again, not all brokers support stop losses on verticals. I do recommend for investors who trade a lot of verticals, move your money to a broker that does support stop loss orders on your verticals. Uh, Grace is saying, hi, Tony, thanks for doing this. So back to your slide. If my if I my trades lose five to six times consecutively, needs to say under 25% of my portfolio. Can you explain it again? Uh, sure. Um, basically, you know, if you have 2% of your account per trade and you have five consecutive losses, then you've only lost 10%. That's below 25%. I'm just using this as, as saying that, you know, if you risk 2%, even with five consecutive losses, you're still well okay with under being under 25% loss of your portfolio. So, but if you exceed this, if you start moving this to 4% of your account per trade, now you're risking 20% of your portfolio. Now you're much closer to the limit or the threshold. So that's why we're telling you to use 2% and not any number higher than that. Michael is saying, hi, Tony, thanks for the reminder and risk management. What's your stop loss percentage you recommend on buying buying the underlying outright? Uh, Michael, if you're talking about the stock itself, I usually tend to put my stops on a stock based on the levels of the stock rather than a percentage. Um, so meaning if, I, you know, if I'm going to buy a stock because it's near a support level, or I usually will buy my stock near support levels, you know, I want to put my stops below those support levels. So they're usually based on the level of the stock rather than a percentage. With a smaller account, can you still stick to the one to two percent rule using liquid options? You first of all, even with a smaller account, you should try to stick to as close to two percent as possible. I understand that if you have you know three four thousand dollar account, it's very difficult to stick to two percent. But again, the goal is to get as close to two percent as possible. That will also limit the number of stocks that you can trade this on. Meaning, meaning mostly you can trade them on stocks that are in the thirty forty fifty dollar range is really your limitation. You you can't trade those two, three hundred dollar stocks, but you know when you're working with a small account, that's what I suggest that you limit yourself to doing. I use a trailing stop once I enter into a trade. However, I have most of the time given a tight stop. So how does uh, I use a trailing stop once I enter in the trade? However. Most of the time, given a tight stop, so it goes out of the trade prematurely. Um, so, Pratap, um, you know, that sounds like you're just send, set, uh, setting a stop that's too tight. Um, you know, you, you have to kind of figure out what is the right stop level for the asset that you're trading. You know, if you're trading something very volatile, you need to adjust that accordingly. So um, that's, just, uh, that's, just gonna, that's just something that's going to take you a bit of experience from trading something more often and understanding what is the appropriate stop levels for that. In your series, buying and selling uh, options, you show a cover call sale as bearish. Is it true that you... Um, Buy, selling a call as bearish. Oh, you're selling se selling a naked call as as bearish. Is it true that you do not want the stock to get 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 to the strike price? Well, yeah. If you're short a call, if the stock goes above your strike price, then you're going to start losing money. Um, so it's not technically it's neutral and bearish. So tomorrow, if you if you actually watch that series, I actually specifically say that. You know, selling a call option is not truly bearish. It's it's new. It's bearish, but not by too much. Um, so if you watch that, especially the slides that I actually get to the short put, you'll see that. Uh, Wayne is saying, Tony, what what potential max loss should we use for a naked put? Um, that's a great question. You know, I tend to find that when you're using a, a naked put, um, you can use the two standard deviation loss. Um, as your kind of sense for your max loss. So for example, if I sold this naked put on Tesla, the 785 put, two standard deviations would result in a $25,000 loss. That is a good starting point in terms of your max loss is that two standard deviation um, move. 
when do you determine loss? What portfolios that use equity with portfolios that use equity and options when you use other than controlled risk? I don't know what you mean by when do you determine loss? Uh, you determine a loss um, you know, when you have a realized uh, gain or loss. So whenever you have a realized gain or loss, that is the time that you want to uh, consider it a loss, um, not an unrealized gain or loss. At what point using the put option strategy not worth tying up capital? I've been using the strategy this last month, but now I have over 100K in earmarked funds I can't trade with. Um, so, you know, Justin, you know, one way that you can get more capital efficient instead of selling puts is selling put credit spreads. That ties up a lot of less capital. You're going to get less income for it, but you're going to tie up also significantly less capital. You know, it's not for me to tell you what strategies to trade or what are most optimal for your portfolio. We all have different portfolios, different outlooks, different risk tolerances. You know, that's something that you have to figure out on your own. But again, if you're looking for more capital efficiency, Instead of selling puts, look at selling a put spread. Uh, for a simple strategy like a short put, it is undefined risk. Uh, so I think that ans I answered that question before. You know, look at the two standard deviation move, um, which is using the PNL simulator and sliding it to one to one extreme. What is your expected loss there? Um, and that is a good starting point for your max loss on a naked or short put. If you're comfortable holding the stock, then doing a cover call on it is okay. Yeah, absolutely. Cover calls is certainly uh, a suitable strategy for someone who's comfortable with holding the stock. Uh, Jay is saying, excellent presentation. Does this theory apply to trading stocks, options, ETFs, or futures? Yes, this theory does. I will say that the percentages are a little different depending on what strategies or what asset class that you trade, but the general concept and the general thesis remains the same. You know, stock investors, you might risk 5% of your account per stock investment. Um, because the chances of a stock, of all your stocks going to zero at the same time are pretty slim, right? It's a little different than, you know, if you have a five credit spreads, losing the, fax, the max loss on those credit spreads are significantly higher than five stocks going to zero. So concept is the same, theory is the same, numbers are a little different depending on the different asset classes. How can you reduce risk to 2% of your portfolio risk with multiple positions? You don't risk your portfolio risk to 2%. You're risking per trade to 2%. Um, so it's 2% of your account per trade. Um, so, and then the whole point is that, you know, if you have a lot of trades, you're going to have, you're going to risk more. So be careful of how many coexisting or open trades you have at the same time. How important is it to have an options tracking spreadsheet? Is that something that can be incorporated into options play? So Mike, um, you know, I, I use my brokerage firm as my options tracking. I, I don't know what brokerage firm you use, but I certainly use my portfolio tracking for that. Um, I don't know. It depends on what you're looking to track. Um, you know, so if you don't mind clarifying. Uh, can we have the slides to download? So William, all of our recordings that we send out to uh, you know everyone after we finish after every webinar, the slides are available as download in the description in YouTube. So if you go to YouTube, and I will uh, show you guys here real quick. If you go to our YouTube channel. Um, for any uh, for any video that you you look at uh, in the description, as you can see, there's always this section called slides. If you click on that link, and it's right here, every single video that we post has a link in the description for the slides. If you click on that link, it'll download the slides for you. So if you want a copy of the slides, just uh, follow us on YouTube. First of all, if you don't follow us on YouTube, I highly recommend that you hit subscribe. Make sure you hit that notification bell uh, because it, it sends you a notification every single time we upload a new video and the slides are always available in the description. How soon after you place a trade do you set up a stop loss? Great question, William. For me personally, 
you know, I, because I run uh, options play and I'm quite busy during the day, I'm not actually in front of my computers trading, despite some of you uh, may think that I'm sitting in front of my computers all day to trading, I'm not. I place my stop losses almost effectively immediately after I get into a trade. And I usually will adjust my stop losses uh, throughout, uh, you know, uh, at least once a day. So if a trade starts to go in my favor, I start moving my stop losses uh, closer to my original entry point to, to further reduce my losses. Um, but I will always put on a stop loss almost immediately after getting into a trade. Since we're only supposed to play what we can afford to lose, doesn't it make sense to be a long-term investor? Um, I'm not sure what the two have to do with each other. I'm not sure how time frame has anything to do with what you can afford to lose because what you can afford to lose, uh, you know, really has nothing to do with how long of a time frame you have on an investment. Uh, Julie, you're very welcome. How long does a trial period last? Mike, uh, the free trial is for 30 days, which should give you enough time to see the platform. You'll be able to see four weeks of market outlook sessions, op options education sessions. You'll be able to attend our Friday morning sessions where we do either rapid fire or thematic investment series. So you really get a feel for you know the trading signals that we send out, the education that we provide, as well as access to the platform during that time. Any recommendations on the max number of positions we should be putting on at any time? So there isn't a limit as to the, the, the number of max positions that you can put on, but the more positions you put on, the less you have to risk per trade. So if let's say, you know, before I was showing you that if you have two uh, consecutive, I'm sorry, if you have two trades per expiration cycle, you're okay, but you want to put on five trades per expiration cycle, you can still do that, but then you can't risk 2% of your account per trade. You have to risk, let's say, half percent of your account per trade. So there's no limit as the number of positions that you can have, but the more you have, the less you have to risk per trade. Well, we see your trades go bearish if the market really turns over. So, you know, I will say a couple of Fridays ago when things started to turn over and we saw that the front month VIX moved higher than the three month VIX, I actually took one short position, but quickly that reversed. Um, let's see. Uh, it's I don't think that we're going to see a big market downturn here just yet. We're going to discuss some of those things tomorrow morning, but certainly if they do, yes, uh, we will certainly turn to more bearish trades. Um, I would argue over the past couple of weeks, I've already started to pare back a lot of our long positions because I'm anticipating this pullback here. That's why we haven't really entered any new long positions over the past week. We've only been um, entering, uh, reducing our long exposure for the most part. Um, you know, so we're, we're testing to see if these are uh, these are buying opportunities on the pullback here. But this could easily, you know, accelerate a little bit more to the downside. So we were we've been aware of that. We've been concerned about that. But those are some of the things again we're going to address tomorrow morning um Uh, Jack, your question about, you know, what has happened in the options market, that's something I plan on covering tomorrow morning. So I hope that you'll be able to join us tomorrow at 9 a.m. for that. How do you factor volatility into your risk management? Um, well, you know, volatility is effectively automatically adjusted into your risk management because uh, when you're, when you, um, the, the premium of the options are effectively naturally adjusted for the options of, for volatility. So, for example, if if a call option is more expensive because things are more volatile, you're going to be able to you're only going to be able to purchase fewer contracts. So volatility is already naturally adjusted. You always want to make sure that the two percent uh, rule sticks, um, and making sure that you remain at that two percent rule. Um, you know the the volatility of the market is naturally adjusted into it. Um, when you say infinite game only has players and dropouts for people that make money, would they not be considered winners? Um, so that's like saying that there are winners in, in operating a business. Um, and if that's the way that you think, you know, and there are some fantastic case studies on this. You know, I, I highly recommend for those of you that are interested, um, watch this YouTube video by Simon uh, Sinek um, about um, winners and losers in terms of business. And, you know, he, he had an interesting... Uh, talk about, you know, different businesses that think of themselves as winners versus losers. I'm sorry, winners versus other businesses that are 
you know, focus more on the infinite game. They don't, they don't think about winners. They don't think about their competitors. They're only focused on building the best possible product. And I would say a good example of this was probably Apple versus Microsoft in the 2000s when, you know, Apple was really focused on building the best possible product. And Microsoft was always out there saying how they're better than Apple and, and how they're winning in certain things. And clearly there was a clear winner on the hardware business from that perspective. You know, it, there's, it, there's a benefit to not thinking about it from a winning and losing perspective and thinking of from an infinite perspective. I, it, it has it has use cases way beyond just trading. You know, for those of you that have interest in, in, in learning about this, um, let me see if I can find that video. I think it's a fantastic video, um, regardless of of whether you're interested in trading or not, or interested in some of these things, just in terms of how it applies to uh, life, really. Um, here, here's the video. I'll send the link to everyone here in the chat window. Uh, I think someone might have already posted it into the chat window, but I, I just posted it into the chat window. This uh, what I think is a fantastic um, summary of the infinite game and why you should think about trading as an infinite game and not as winning and losing. Because and, and, and just so you know, you know why we don't think of, of of trading as winning and losing is because you can always make more money than what you've made. And that's really what you should be focusing on is not winning or losing, but just making sure that you don't drop out. Um, because, I mean, I can go on and on about this, um, but I, I think, I think you know, Simon does a very good job of explaining a better job than I can do it in, in, in 30 seconds here. So I highly recommend that you watch that video. Um, Robert, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, is it total? Is it total positions open or total positions open at a particular expiration that should be aggregated? It's really total positions that are open at an, at a particular expiration that should be aggregated. But you know, if let's say you have uh, one that expires, you know, five that expire this week and five expires next week, they're fairly close to each other, right? Um, so, but if you have five that expire this week, five that expire next month, you know, then you can kind of separate them. There's no right or wrong answer here. Uh, what I'm trying to provide you with just a framework as to how you should start thinking about this. Um, but it, when we refer to aggregate, we're referring to aggregate per expiration. Um, Antonio, our free trial is a fully functioning free trial. So there's nothing that you're not getting as a free trial member. We make our free trials completely fully functional. So you see everything. There's nothing that you unlock, if you will, as a member. Um, so uh, we purposely made that so that you can see everything that you get. If a trade goes sour out of the box, should you cut your losses at that time? Um, Dennis, I would say that, that that's that's very hard to answer because there's no context around that. It depends on what your trade is. It depends on you know what your strategy that you traded was. You know, if you traded an out of the money call option, I would argue yes. If you traded a credit spread, I would argue no. Um, so there's just too much, too many other things that you need we need to to look at in order to answer that question. It's just simply not black and white like that. On a 100K account, if you've made 10 trades, is the 10% rule applicable for what is remaining in the account or based on the original 100K? So like I said, you know, if you have any sizable changes in your portfolio, you need to recalculate the 2% rule. If you made 10 trades and your account is still $100,000, then no, you don't have to change anything. Any recommendations on the max number of positions we're putting on at one time? So. Priyank, I think the way to think about this is not necessarily, you know, how much are you putting at risk that determines what you are, uh, how many max positions 
max positions should be determined by how much time you have to manage all of those positions. If you have the time, if you're if you're a full time trader, you could manage probably eighty to one hundred positions. If you trade once a day, you know for for 20, 30 minutes, you might want to reduce the number of positions that you have because you may not have the time to keep up with all of the positions um, and managing all of those positions. So it's really more around time management than it is around risk management. Risk management just the more trades you have, the less you risk per trade. The less trades you have, the slightly more you can risk per trade. Is there a way to reconstruct an existing working trade into your calculator? Um, Tony, so that's something that we're currently working on, especially with respect to portfolio so that users can have access to portfolio. Um, we are working on a technology that allows you to pull in your positions into portfolio directly from your brokerage firm. Um, is the 50% stop the best way to maximize profit but limit losses? Um, the 50% stop loss you know, is not applicable for all trades. It's only applicable for some types of trades, usually debit trades like long calls and puts, debit spreads. Those are usually only the, uh, the only strategies that make sense to use that stop loss. Uh, for those of us with smaller account sizes, like for example, $7,000, how do we participate in options playing, options trading while following the 2% rule? So 7 2% of 7K uh, uh, is, is that not $350? Uh, no, it's a hundred, sorry. Um, it's $140. So, you know, you, you're fairly limited in terms of the number of positions that you can trade um, in a, in, in a $7,000 portfolio. But so if your portfolio is $7,000, you may have to find yourself exceeding two to three, you might exceed 2%. So you might find yourself closer to 4% to find trades that are two to $300 in max risk, meaning you're really limited to one contract at a time. Um, and, so you can exceed the 2% rule, but if you're going to exceed the 2% rule, you need to reduce the number of open trades that you have at any one time. Someone who keeps to the 2% rule can have multiple open trades at the same time. If you exceed that 2% rule, let's say you find yourself closer to 4%, then you have to reduce the number of open trades that you have at any one time. You can exceed the 2% rule when you have such a small account. It's simply because you have no other choice. Um, but you know, to account for that, you just have to reduce the number of open trades that you have versus a larger account with the 2% rule, you can have more open trades at the same time. If I own a call, can I make it a spread later by selling a higher price call? You absolutely can, Robert. As long as you have the ability to trade spreads in your account, once you have the long call, you can sell the second call at any time. Uh, like a 50% stop loss, do you also have a time limit for exiting a trade if it's not moving in your direction? It depends on the strategy. Some strategies have a time limit, especially when you're short uh, an option. So most short options trades like a credit spread, iron condor, straddles, usually want to uh, you know roll those out about two to three weeks from expiration. Our rule of thumb is 21 days, um, but you know anywhere in that 14 to 21 day window is uh, reasonable as long as you stick to a, to a rule. Um, at what percentage do you cut your losses on any trade? So Jack, it depends on the strategy. Some strategies at 50%, other strategies at 100% of max gain. It really just depends on the strategy. If you wanna find out more, go to our YouTube channel, find the strategy that you're interested in trading. We'll talk about the rules for managing stop losses for that specific strategy. What are your thoughts about dollar cost averaging of a call option moves lower? Um, I, Tim, I hope that my first slide tells you how, what I think about dollar cost averaging. I don't think it's a good idea unless, you, let's say, you only risk 1% on the first trade and then you want to give yourself the option of risking the other 1% on the second trade. That is the only time where, in my opinion, dollar cost averaging works. Dollar cost averaging is really more of a stock trading technique where it allows you to acquire a, a, a large number of shares uh, over, over a longer period of time so that you average out the, the, the cost that you buy it at. It's not an options trading strategy at all. 
Is there a recommended max percentage loss on an options trade? For example, I hear from some gurus that if you should exit an, an option, if it drops 50%, regardless of how much time you have left in your option. Uh, so Raphael, that's exactly what I suggested with a 50% stop loss, but that only applies for certain strategies. That applies for debit strategies. 50% rule is a good rule for most debit strategies, not for credit strategies though. So um, don't just apply these types of blanket um, you know, rules to all option strategies. Each option strategy is a little different. What time is the market chat tomorrow morning? It's at 9 a.m. Eastern time, 30 minutes before the open. Johnny, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Sunil, what is the trade number calculated from? What is the true? Oh, um, if someone's asking about the options play score, the options play score is the risk to reward metric. We did it because most people look at max risk of 102,000, max risk of 45,000, and a probability of profit of 33%. And they say to themselves, I don't really have a good sense for whether that risk to reward ratio is in my favor, against me, good or bad. That's why we created the options play score and we color coded it to give you a sense for whether the option that you're trading has a slight edge in your favor against you or no edge at all. And it's all color coded. Red means that it's slightly uh, uh, skewed against you in terms of probabilities. Uh, green means it's slightly skewed in your favor in terms of probabilities. And anything in yellow means that you don't really have a favor one way or another. Basic question. You do many vertical puts and calls. When do you get to get? When do you know how to get in and out of them? So, uh, Joe, uh, you know, I have all of these rules in my YouTube videos on my vertical spreads. I have specific videos on credit spreads. I have specific videos on debit spreads. Each one of those, I tell you exactly what my rules for rules for finding the optimal strategy in terms of entering and what the rules that we have in place for exiting them. And you can, uh, you know, have videos on short videos too as well on credit spreads and debit spreads and just the general rules around managing them. Uh, can you show how to set up a put vertical or update a put vertical recommendation? Um, when you say how to set up a put vertical, um, so if you're talking about a, a short put, if you're talking about a long put vertical here, you, all you have to do is click on I'm bearish, will automatically give you the put vertical here for any stock. So you can type in any stock, click on I'm bearish, and we'll show you that long put vertical here on the right hand side. What percentage of NLV should be held in cash at all times? Net, is NLV net liquidating value? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure that I usually think of it in terms of what percentage should be held in cash at all times. I will say that you know most of my portfolio is if you know if it's not invested in options, is invested in longer term investments in stocks or ETFs. I usually don't hold a lot of cash in my portfolio, but that's me. And I don't think that necessarily applies to everyone. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule as to what percentage of your account you should hold in cash. I also think that that highly depends on what your risk tolerance is and how close you are to retirement. So there's just too many other factors to, for you to have like a hard and fast rule on that, in my opinion. Trades are between 40 to 50%. Is there a way to locate options trades with 90% probability of higher range in options play? So Sunil asks a great question. And I think this speaks to, in my opinion, um, a lack of understanding as to how uh, options trading works. Um, because on paper, right? So let's say, let's say, you know, let, let's just look at Nor Norwegian Cruise Lines trade that we were looking at yesterday. And, uh, you know, our trade was a short put vertical. I think it was in April uh, 26 and a half, or I'm sorry, uh, 25. We were short the 25, 21 type vertical spread, something like this, where you have a 40, 50, 55, 60% expiration uh, uh, probability of profit. And Sunil is asking, how do you find something with a 90% probability of profit, right? Because why, why would you want to trade something of 55% probability of profit when you can trade something with 90% probability of profit? Doesn't that sound so much better? The, what that tells me is that this is a lack of understanding the relationship between risk to reward 
and probability. So risk to reward and probability sit on opposite ends, meaning if you have something with very high probability, you're going to have really poor risk to reward. If you have something with really poor probability, you're going to have really great risk to reward. So whenever someone tells me that they want to seek something with 90% probability of profit, what that tells me is that they don't understand the relationship with probability and risk to reward. Because yes, I can sell some like this. Um, let's say I do something like this. I'm going to have a much higher probability of profit. Um, you can get some pretty skewed, you can get some really skewed um, uh, risk to rewards. And maybe if I go to April's, I'll be able to find something. Whoops, uh, the strike prices aren't great there. Um, here, let me, let me show you how I can find something with really good risk to reward. Um, so this has an 88% probability of profit, right? Doesn't that sound great? But is that worth it? You're making $10 on a trade while risking $290, right? So that's 88% probability of profit. That means nine out of 10 times, nine times I will make $10. And the one time that I lose, uh, I'll lose $290. So put that, you know, do the math behind that. Does that make sense? The answer is no. Um, and, and you can even find trades that are 99% probability of profit. And someone will say, yes, I want to win 99% of the time. But is that worth it if that 1% of the time that you lose, you wipe out what you've gained the other 99 times and maybe three or four times over? The answer is no. So, so no, yes, there are plenty of ways to find very high probability trades. Should you seek that? I don't think you should. Um, but if you want to, you know, you, you just find these really far out in the money credit spreads, you can go out there and sell them very high probability of profit. Um, but just be aware of the risks that you're taking when you're doing that. Um, okay, with that, that covers, uh, you know, I've tried to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I want to thank everyone so much for your time uh, and your participation, your questions, and just all the feedback that everyone provides us with on these sessions. So I really look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow bright and early at 9 a.m. on our next Market Outlook session. I will send out the recording with the slides as soon as we finish your processing here today. So with that, thank you so much. I hope you guys have a great evening and that you've learned something from today's session. And I will see you bright and early. Have a great trading day.